The COVID-19 pandemic has been a crisis like no other, affecting governments, businesses, large and small, uh, individuals, uh, in many ways, uh, from safety of people to productivity and ability to work from home to issues to do with how do you even manage your working capital as well as liquidity challenges. A survey by PwC reveals that liquidity concerns rank the highest among the list of business concerns related to the impact of COVID-19. CEOs must therefore address liquidity challenges by reviewing investment decisions, forecasting, risk, predicting inventory needs, realign supply chains, and manage business profitability. Good morning if you are joining us from Nigeria, and good day if you are joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Taiwo Yedele, the Fiscal Policy Partner and West Africa Task Leader at PwC, and the thematic lead for the Public Finance and Taxation Policy Commission of the NESD. At this CEO roundtable session, we'll be discussing an important topic, which is addressing liquidity constraints. Joining me to discuss this important topic, I have four amazing panelists. In no particular order, I'll start by introducing Mr. Kiari Buka, CEO, Trans-Saharan Investment Corporation. He is the co-founder and CEO of Trans-Sahara Investment Corporation, one of Nigeria's leading investment firms. He previously served as the CEO of the Central Securities Clearing System and Value Card Nigeria PLC, now Unified Payment Systems Limited. Next is Ms. Femi Olayebi, founder and chief creative director, Femi Handbags. Femi is a seasoned entrepreneur with many years of experience in the Nigerian business landscape. She is the chief creative director of Femi Handbags, a luxury line of leather handbags and accessories. Next, Mr. Lanre Akimbo, CEO Wiser Advisory. Lanre is an entrepreneur, multidisciplinary professional, and strategy advisor to multilateral institutions and boards of directors of leading companies. Last but certainly not the least, Ms. Yemi Kerry, CEO Hakabella Limited. Yemi is one of the foremost women in technology in Nigeria with over 22 years of experience at top management levels, both in the public and private sectors. So uh, in the next one hour, 15 minutes or thereabouts, we're gonna be discussing this important topic of liquidity. They say cash is king. And of course is the lifeblood of any business, whether it's for profit or not for profit, as well as for government. But today we'll be focusing on how does this affect CEOs, their businesses, and above all, what can they do about it? Sharing from the experiences of our panelists. I would start now by asking um, our panelists to share their initial reaction and thoughts about the subject of um, you know, COVID-19 and the impact they've been seeing on businesses from their perspective. Uh, if I may, let me start by asking Kiari to start uh, to make a very brief introductory remark in about two to three minutes. Uh, thank you, Taiwo. Um, I, um, it, it's an, it's, this is an um, apt and appropriate uh, topic for discussion, um, not only if, uh, during this uh, summit, but also uh, the era that we are in, uh, which started uh, early uh, this year. Uh, and one of the things that actually struck me as somebody who has been looking at the uh, especially the monetary space is that at a macro level, 
uh, the central bank has been uh, playing all kinds of unorthodox um, liquidity management uh, issues. And uh, I think uh, one of the lifebloods of any economy is the banks to release, um, uh, to lend. But when the, with the DCRR's regime of the central bank, which actually started quite early la uh, last year, uh, and it became so aggressive that that has now on average, I understand that banks have actually have or close to 60% on average of their deposits quarantined, which is that they are not even available to be lent out uh, should there be a lending space. Of course, the pandemic has also created revenue issues for the companies. So businesses are not getting enough revenue and there is no uh, nowhere to go to get um, even funding, even at a debt level or whatever. So it has become a major constraint, generally speaking, uh, at a macro level. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. Uh, can I ask uh, Femi to make her comments? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Tunde. I'm really honored to be here today. Um, for us as an SME, uh, I must admit that um, I, we were totally unprepared for the pandemic and we didn't, even though there were many signs here and there and there was a lot of um, COVID-19 in the news, um, we just were simply uh, un unprepared. We run a manufacturing outfit and apart from producing my leather line of um, handbags, which I'm probably better known for, uh, we also, we've also produced conference bags and folders over the years and built a fairly good um, client base. In fact, I, I would like to say that this is the bread and butter of, uh, for our company. Uh, so what happens normally at the beginning of every year is that we would already have a solid lineup of, um, of clients, I, I mean, of, of conferences that we needed to cater for um, as the year uh, proceeded. But this year was different. And by early March, we noticed that nothing was coming in, nobody was answering us. And it, we came to that slow realization that something was very wrong. Um, in fact, at some point we, we made presentation after presentation, but um, nothing, nothing came, no, no deals were sealed. And um, some of our clients even stopped picking up their phones. Um, so at that, at that point we realized, okay, we needed to shut our doors, even though I'm, I'm based in Ibadan. And um, even though Ibadan was not on lockdown, I had to, we had to shut down. And I, I, the, the, mm -hmm. it was simply the smartest thing to do at the, at the time. I, I, I remember at, on that day, March 24, um, so many scenarios flashing through my mind. And I felt this burden because I knew that my staff, all my members of staff were looking at me for survival. So whether they were blue collar, whether they were white collar staff, everybody was looking at me like, okay, Mrs. O is going to fix us. She's going to sort us out. Um, so I also quickly swung into survival mode. And uh, the first thing we did was we bought bags of rice and loads of vitamin C and sent everybody off home. Um, of course, um, from early January, nothing had been happening. I have a, shop, a store in Ikoyi and the sales had been just trickling in, you know, so we were not, there was no revenue coming in. And I was looking at my cash dripping down and nothing, there, there was simply no revenue. Um, and I know that it wasn't just for me, at, at the time, naturally, nobody was thinking of buying a pretty handbag. That was just at the bottom of everybody's uh, um, um, bucket list. But fast forward to today, uh, we're still standing. We've survived the pandemic, but not because we had the funds or, or the reserves um, to, and that's one critical lesson I learned. The economy says so also um, for individuals, for companies that least have enough to tide you over for, for six months. But more, um, more importantly, it was, um, it's critical. One lesson I did also um, come to terms with was, it's critical to accord our internal customers and that's our staff, um, as much respect as we do our external customers. So that in a the, in the time of crisis, um, you're able to ride the storm together. And, and that's what, what we did. So even when we started dropping salaries from 50% to 30%, and almost nothing, they, we all, they all still held on. And today I still have all my staff um, intact. But it wasn't that that saved us. What really saved, what did it for us during the crisis was that um, we signed a partnership with the Mastercard Foundation to produce hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of non-medical um, protective equipment. And that's what really helped us to stay afloat. So really um, for me at the end of the day, um, 
We survived not because we had the cash, but because we had great collaborative partners. Um, we, had, um, we had systems and processes in place that kept propping us up so that when the opportunities came, we could grab them. And, and we had already um, also built very strong business relationships across board that helped um, us ease the pain. Mm, indeed, very useful experience there. Uh, and it also speaks to the theme of the entire summit about the power of partnership. So uh, we're grateful that you're able to weather the storm, at least up till now. Uh, so people can do virtual conferences, but as we see, we can't do virtual bags. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask Larry to make his comments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as we've seen from the background, you know, from Kerry and from uh, Femi, and I'm sure Yemi also would uh, allude to this, uh, businesses are experiencing um, quite uh, some headwind, you know, uh, lower demand, reduce of operations, uh, disruptions to supply chains, you know, and all of these have uh, resulted in lower revenues and indeed uh, cash inflows, you know, which is the liquidity constraint we're talking about. Um, as we know, there are strong linkages between the health of businesses and the wider economy, particularly from the viewpoint of employment, um, insecurity, uh, and so on. And therefore, it's important to collectively and uh, aggressively tackle business challenges. Uh, businesses need, therefore, to be a bit more agile um, in order to be able to weather going concern or business continuity risks that may arise from liquidity pressures. However, um, I, I would say that there's only so much a business can do. Uh, quite a lot depends on the operating environment, which I think is um, part of what uh, Kerry alluded to in, in his opening remarks. Um, I hope that we, we get a chance to discuss this in, in, in greater detail during this session. Uh, in my view, there are two broad options that will be available uh, to business. I, and I, I speak now as someone who, you know, who consults for companies, who provides advisory services uh, uh, to, to, to companies uh, you know, across the, 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 the the whole spectrum, you know, from small, medium, and, and large, large um, uh, businesses. Uh, there are two broad, two broad options. You know, um, we have what I would call internal options, and uh, the other is the external options. The internal options are purely within the control, well, largely within the control of, of businesses. Whereas the external options um, have to do with the regulatory environment, the operating environment, you know, fiscal, monetary, and other policies that governments at all levels and their regulatory agencies, you know. Um, have to put in place and that businesses have to be ready to respond to. We also see that in some cases, there's just either apathy or um, a lack of uh, awareness of, of, of um, incentives and intervention programs going on. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and I look forward to discussing in greater detail um, you know, during this session, suggestions on how businesses can weather the uh, liquidity headwinds. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Larry. That's a very good point there about knowledge and awareness. Maybe the only other issue that it's more dire than not having cash is not having the right knowledge. So even when there are these interventions and all these and that by government, if people are not aware, they just can't leverage on those opportunities. Let me ask Yemi um, to make her uh, comments and uh, share her initial thoughts on the, on the subject. <clears throat> Morning, Taiwo, and thanks for having okay. me here. Um, basically, uh, I mean, Buka has looked at the at the response of the financial institutions. Um, Femi has shared her experience about about how she survived, and um, Larry has looked at the broad spectrum of the of businesses. But how how did the liquidity affect? the general populace and, and my experience during the pandemic um, was really, you know, that there was no, very little possible um, um, for, for people to, to, to exist. And, and so people turned to a kind of survival mode. Uh, within my company, the, the employees had to be assured that um, <clears throat> they would be able to afford their sustenance because there had been a lot of rumors around people letting people go, 
um, you, you know, going home, not doing anything. Uh, business was trifled. Um, that we didn't have any 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 customers coming to us um, at, at the initial stage, and then the lockdown, and and you you could you know you could physically see how people on the streets uh, and and um, a lot of businesses took it upon themselves not to only to look internally at their own employees, but you started seeing people going out and giving out food on a daily basis to people on the streets. Um, the health issues were were another one. Um, the uncertainty of what it was, uh, COVID was, and and how long it would be. It would be there was no communication in terms of. Um, the, the, the longevity of, of, of this um, 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 pandemic. And, and so for, for businesses, they, they, they had to look for a, a different way of survivors. A lot of, a lot of businesses um, changed their strategy, just like Femi has alluded to. And, and uh, we, we began to see a lot of requests because of the lockdown within our own business for automation of businesses, business processes, how could I do things and live virtually, and all of those things. But the liquidity concerns were very, um, top on, on the list of business um, owners. Yeah, thank you very much for that, um, Yemi. I think what, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you just continue with that line of thought, is to share whether you see, you know, we know the impact has been very significant uh, on many industries, businesses, and sectors. But from your perspective and in your industry, uh, would you say there were any positives, maybe as a result of these people just becoming more innovative or what it is? What is it that you're seeing? Okay, um, uh, generally the, in, in terms of businesses and how they're doing things, um, I would say there's a liquidity crisis. crisis. Um, um, business owners have to make decisions or whether to, they want to, um, you know, survive or whether they have, they have to make moral decisions how to keep their employees. The other thing is really uh, in terms of cash. Um, but in the, in the IT industry, you began to see uh, an upward demand for services. You, you know, IBTC reports says that the, 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 um, the recommend, recommended the growth we, in, in quarter two, or, or in the sector was about 15% um, year on year. And, and from the data from the, um, um, NCC, the subscribers in, within 18 months shot up to about 159 um, uh, million, million subscribers at August. Uh, and so this, this had an, a positive impact on our, uh, on, our, on our ICT sector, the business automation of, uh, of, of, of various sectors, um, uh, businesses, people demanded for how to live life virtually, um, you know, uh, the, the Zoom and other co collaboration tools request was increased. Um, because we had people want, want having to understand how to um, increase their business um, without without moving around. Obviously, the lifestyle change. You had remote home working. You had people um, doing meetings, trainings, and consultations. The health sector had consultations. Um, going on. So in the health sector, we had a lot of demand for uh, telemedicine and, 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 um, and access. access. Um, in, in, the, in the digital payment space, of course, people had to look for a, a way in which they can continue to assess basics, food, and, uh, and so the, there was an increase in, in the e-commerce sector. Um, and, and then of course, customer management and solutions started to come up, you know, um, companies required uh, uh, platforms and applications such that they could take their goods from one place to another. And also within that space, increase the, um, their customer uh, footprint. So all of these, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, was positive for the ICT sector. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think the general belief out there is that the technology sector is, is one of the 
beneficiaries of COVID-19. Maybe next to that would be the health sector. Um, but I think generally for all of us, uh, COVID-19 has taught us a lesson in technology adoption and just looking for better ways of doing things. Hopefully we can take this efficiency forward uh, even beyond COVID-19. Let me turn to you, Lanre. We already said that cash is king. Without liquidity, there can be no business continuity. To what extent have you seen heightened business continuity risk as a result of liquidity challenges, especially for SMEs? Do you see any opportunities? Um, indeed, um, the, the, the effect on business continuity um, across board, across sectors, um, has been quite extensive. Um, you know, it, quite a few businesses have tried. You know, we, we mentioned uh, the technology uh, sector. Um, you know, to some extent, logistics. Um, however, several others um, have have struggled significantly, and um, these are these um, pressures have, uh, in some cases, you know, these are very significant. Um, so to say, life threatening issues for for businesses. You know, uh, in terms of the implications for business continuity and what you know you call going concern assumption. The very basic assumption upon which a business you know um, operates you know in that that it will continue to the foreseeable future for some businesses they couldn't uh, provide such as assurances you know to to their to their stakeholders of course we've talked about operations you know uh demand you know uh difficulty collecting receivables now even where some businesses managed or continue to manage operations at near normal levels there are significant logistical disruptions you know inability to evacuate products, you know, uh, of course, leading to decline in revenues and uh, inability to meet their obligations. So as you can imagine, um, you know, the thing with, with these liquidity constraints is that they tend to have a lingering effect, you know. So uh, we're talking things that happened from earlier this year, March, April, you know, uh, particularly the, the, the lockdown that was imposed, you know. But quite a few businesses have not recovered, you know, because, you know, you, you basically, for some of them, living literally from hand to mouth, you know. Mm. Um, so uh, this, this, I mean, you can imagine, you know, um, uh, businesses that operate in, in certain sectors like hospitality, aviation, you know, um, you know, and to some extent even entertainment, you know. Imagine, you know, um, somebody who operates a cinema, and, and things like that. Yeah. So those, these are these, these, these problems have been well documented. Do, do I see opportunities? Uh, yes. I, I think that. Hopefully, at the end of this this crisis period, um, some level of rigor, you know, would have been adopted by by businesses. You know, I think that you know businesses really need to uh, prepare very detailed recovery plans. And, and I heard uh, what 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 Femi and uh, Yemi said about how their businesses responded. Very detailed business uh, recovery plans. Uh, you need to, you know, le the leadership of business really need to get to the brass tacks, understand the numbers, forecast your liquidity and working capital requirements. In fact, carry out, you know, what we call scenario analysis. Try to imagine what the worst case would be. You know, what if you don't make revenues for the next three months? What happens? What if one naira of cash flow doesn't come in, in into the business? How do you respond? And you know, we speak to some of the stakeholder engagements that uh, Femi had with her people, where people that were willing to take up to a thirty, you know, seventy percent pay cuts, you know. And still continue to sh show up to work, and that's the whole that stakeholder you know um, um, engagement. So you prepare your recovery plan, you you prepare your your forecast of your cash flows um, over the, the short term to see you know what you can defer, you know particularly discretion, discretionary um, um, expenses, you know uh, capital expenditure. You might need to defer, you might need to cancel, you might need to uh, stagger some of those investments. Um, I think there's also opportunity to. Explore refinancing because you know in the last close to maybe eleven months now we've seen a low um, interest rate environment. Uh, so companies that have existing um, facilities, debt facilities that they are financing probably at 18, 20 percent, it's an opportunity to to get into refinancing discussions with other lenders. Uh, rates are, are, are crashing, and uh, so that provides you you know some breathing room if you if you don't have to make so much in terms of cash outflow to to, to service your debt. Keep an eye, we mentioned this, you know, I mentioned this in my opening remark, keep an eye on tax reliefs that are there. It's better to, to understand uh, what's going on, what reliefs are available, you know, um, to the CBN, to, to you know, government uh, financial support, 
Um, in fact, even some state governments, you know, and hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss that um, uh, later, have provided some, you know, little relief here and there in order to help companies manage uh, their, their cash flows. Um, companies should explore exiting non-core, uh, you know, um, investments. You know, however, the I think the, the big one for companies that are exposed to foreign exchange, uh, uh, to the foreign exchange market, where, for example, your inputs have to be sourced uh, in, in, foreign, in foreign exchange, um, that's I, I foresee, you know, in, in the foreseeable future might be called, might still be intractable, uh, particularly if outputs and production, you know, continue to be suppressed and uh, oil prices, you know, do not recover significantly. Um, mm -hmm. To that, I would say that businesses can explore diversification opportunities. I believe uh, Yemi mentioned that also. You need to yeah. rethink, businesses can rethink their business models, you know, basically, you know, just revisit who your customers are, what you provide to them and how you provide them, th those services mm -hmm. or goods. You know, Indeed. and then um, you know, diversify sources of, of supplies of input also. So those are opportunities that I see for businesses. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Landry. Um, I think we're all concerned about whether you know businesses will recover, whether many businesses would even come back again, ever again. Uh, particularly if you think about the very high unemployment and underemployment rate in Nigeria. You know, like COVID nineteen itself. You know, they say until everybody is safe, then no one is safe. Uh, so I think it applies to businesses to some extent in the sense that sometimes it's not just about your own business continuity, but also about the entire value chain. So let me turn to Femi. So to survive, a company needs to secure its entire value chain, especially suppliers and customers. Have you seen more pressures from suppliers and slower payments or even increase in defaults from customers. You're on mute. Yes, I okay. realize that. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, we run a factory and um, we're in the business of manufacturing. So the moment the um, pandemic hits, uh, we knew that moving forward, of course, no one had an idea of how long this was going to last. And um, honestly, who, who would have imagined that seven, eight months down the line, we're, we're still in, in the midst of it. But we, we, we knew that the part of the supply chain that would be most at risk for us was uh, material sourcing, um, paying our suppliers because we were very low on cash. Um, if the need arose or if we got any orders and getting our hardware and accessories from um, um, our suppliers because all our hardware and accessories uh, come from Italy and of course at the time Italy was on total lockdown so and of course you have um, along the chain you have the production itself you have the distribution channels and you have um, marketing and all the all the other moving parts sales of course had um, slowed down drastically and at some point in the early days of the pandemic, uh, there was absolutely nothing, zero, zero Naira coming in, zero dollars, zero, zero Naira. But when we did start getting the orders, interestingly, for some reason, and uh, we put that down to maybe a feel, feel good factor on the, on the side of our, on the part of our customers who were probably feeling the, the pinch of the lockdown. We made our first website sales um, during the, in the thick of the pandemic. And, um, but we did not, ex I won't say we experienced any slow uh, payments. Uh, we did not experience any defaulting customers. Um, we probably because we had built a, a, a loyal customer base over the years. Um, but then it was also the time when the borders were closed. So whatever it was we're trying to um, um, get from, from our suppliers at the time, the prices had gone up, gone through the roof. Um, and even to distribute, um, distribution became pretty difficult. Um, shipping was expensive, extremely expensive. And um, we had to take business decisions and um, decide whether we were going to raise our costs, the cost of our goods, or whether we were going to just leave them as. But we decided that um, it wasn't fair on the customer to, to bear the extra cost. Um, and so we left our cost like that and just made less, less profit. Again, um, like I said, we had built quite a bit of goodwill um, over the years. So um, we were able to get quite a bit of credit from our, our suppliers. So when we had any requirements, it, it was not a problem sending leathers to Ibadan because that's where we're based. Um, and they, because there were, there were never any trust issues uh, with, my, with my suppliers. 
of course, one, one big lesson, like I've mentioned, um, that, that stood out for me was that relationships do matter. You know, so building strong relationships in the course of doing business sort of helps you tide, tide things over, you know, helps your business growth. And uh, when there's a crisis like this, uh, it, it doesn't put you too much uh, under too much pressure. It was actually our suppliers who were not selling, who, who had a lot of stock, um, but we're not some of our suppliers who had a lot of stock and we're not selling that we're putting pressure on us to please purchase um, from them. Um, in terms of uh, trying to bring anything in from abroad at the time it was impossible because um, Italy was on lockdown. Um, and um, we, but, but luckily for us, we had, we had enough stock to tide us over. Luckily, we, and, and that was lucky for us. And then even with our inventory, because we, we run a bespoke, um, um, what would I call it, on-demand type of business model. We never really had too many finished leather, uh, leather goods on, on the ground. And of course, when it came to deliveries, we finally decided we had been trying to uh, decide whether to sign on with DHL because of course DHL had the special concessions for SMEs. So we finally decided to sign up with DHL because they were also operating skeletal services at the time. And um, of course, for local deliveries, there was no problem, even though it was a bit small, I mean, it was a bit slow, but for the international deliveries, what we then said to our customers at the time was, you know what, you would have to wait until uh, flights are, uh, are operational and then you can get your, your goods to you. But we kept, we kept producing because we had quite a bit of, um, 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 we had raw materials, but we had quite a few raw materials on the, on the ground. Um, but yeah, mm. things have since picked up and <laughs> we're getting back on track. Mm, yeah, very interesting indeed. I think it's really, you know, an ecosystem and I like the points around, you know, goodwill, relationship. I think that people just have to be aware that this is not the time to take advantage of other stakeholders, uh, because if you squeeze life out of them and they go out of business before you know it, it comes back to haunt you. So very interesting. And, and let me turn to Kiari. And I see, you know, Femi made the point around importation from Italy, and Larry also alluded to the point around, you know, on one hand, there's a liquidity problem, but it's even more another dimension if you have to look for that liquidity in foreign currency. So, Kiari, um, so the, the point is that many businesses not only have to worry about Naira liquidity, they, they have to also deal with the additional pressure of forex scarcity. What are you seeing and what do you think affected businesses can do? Um, thank you, Taiwo. Um, one of the key things that has been happening even prior to the pandemic hitting the whole world, uh, in our case, uh, for, for us in Nigeria, is the pressure on oil prices. And as a mono um, product economy, what we have found was that the declining oil prices means scarcity uh, of FX availability. And that was actually playing out. And then boom, suddenly the, um, the, the, the pandemic um, you know, showed up and that basically exacerbated the situation for us. Um, we were uh, basically going through serious debts and when the initial FX issues started to show up uh, towards the end of last year, some of our even foreign investors, um, you know, put on the brakes in terms of bringing in foreign portfolio investors and also even FDI. So essentially what that has done for us was that we were already being primed on FX scarcity in the first place, then suddenly the pandemic hit us and that basically exacerbated the situation for us as an economy. So for businesses, what I would suggest actually is to see if, especially businesses that have products and services that they could export. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I've seen that actually even in the tech space where things are happening uh, and there are a lot of buzz and excitement in some of the attraction, uh, not only in terms of investments, but also some of the products and services. I have seen a young person who has developed a competitor to Zoom in Nigeria. Uh, of course, it's a copying of a copy and paste kind of thing, but 
Mm. What I actually would see more and more, uh, especially in some of the segments of, uh, of our industries, is that they would have to be creative and innovative. Uh, and then also be looking at markets beyond the shores. Of course, your first market is always your home country, but certainly export export. Uh, business would now begin to be an opportunistic uh, for for businesses to go into. So essentially, it's a really a tough challenge. We have inflationary pressure between January and today. Inflation had gone up from 12 to 14 percent. Uh, the naira liquidity, and then suddenly now FX availability. So essentially, businesses. I mean, I pity anybody running a business that is. Uh, mainly focused on the domestic uh, market. Uh, so, so of course, there is also the constraint in the supply chain, which actually exacerbates situation, even if you are exporter. Uh, so so the, the effects of availability has become uh, dire, and that's what has uh, put the pressure on the Naira dollar or Naira convertibility rates. Um, the, the, the Naira has been depreciating uh, over the last few months. And it con that pressure continues on until we reach a stage where either something happens or we change our policies to attract more investments. Now, the other thing that one has to take note of is that from January to date, globally, countries have injected a lot of liquidity uh, into their economies. So the only one where we it's liquidity is being mopped up is Nigeria. But we need to attract those few trillion dollars that have been injected into the global economy. Uh, and and that, is, that can only happen when the investors decide or feel that Nigeria is open for business. So far, they are, they, 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 there is serious suspicion of our monetary, and, uh, monetary policy as regards FX and FX uh, uh, exchange rate. So essentially, those are some of the key pointers at both at the macro level and also at the at the micro at the business businesses level. So so essentially, we need to pay particular attention on how we can become attractive and get the, some of those flows into our economy. Yeah, yeah, indeed, very interesting perspective there. You know, even at the session yesterday one of the plenaries. Uh, so this point, uh, even before COVID-19, we had about $17 trillion of investable funds around the world that are either attracting zero or negative returns. I think with COVID, that grew to about $19 trillion. And here we are in Nigeria. We have pos positive returns on investment, but the funds are just not coming. So it has to be something to do with the risk profile of the country and particularly issues around policy, monetary and otherwise. Uh, so, you know, someone was even saying that COVID-19 started affecting Nigeria before the virus itself landed in Nigeria, because once the price of crude oil started going down, we were feeling it even without the virus being physically here. Let me turn back to Femi. You know, you made a point about, you know, cutting salaries while keeping your staff. Um, we know that different businesses would adopt different strategies or a combination of them. We've seen those who are cutting costs. We've seen those who are laying off. We've seen those who are trying to borrow or some who have existing borrowing, trying to restructure them. So I think the point I would like you to just maybe a little bit amplify is at the point where you thought about cutting salaries, did it you know, cross your mind to say, should I just fire everyone? And then when things get back to normal, you try and find a way to talk to them nicely if they want to come back. So what was the experience like for you? I know it must have been tough. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tuli. Yes, um, it definitely was tough. And I think that the first emotion that gripped me was uh, the emotion of fear. But I know that um, not for one second did I think that I was going to lay um, any of my staff off. I just, I, I just felt, I knew that somehow we were going to be just fine. Um, uh, we were not prepared. Um, a lot of my staff have been with me for many, many, many years, some even 20 years. So it didn't even cross my mind at the time to, to, to lay anyone off. What, what, what exactly was I going to tell them? 
we were just we were just going to have to write this together and um, and we're lucky we, we we are definitely lucky that we're, we're still standing um unfortunately for us we didn't we didn't fall into the category of um, an essential service if i can say that so we're not like a health service and we were we're not in our greek because those seem to be the the, the pivot, pivotal um, um, sectors at the time so trying to think through what can I do was very difficult. Um, even though you feel, oh, you know what, you're the leader here and you need to be flexible, you need to come up with a, a master plan. It was just as difficult for me as probably was, was for them. I know that a lot of factories at the time, um, or factories or even those who knew people with factories immediately started making masks because that was the, um, that, was, that became an essential item immediately. I, I was a bit slower to jump on, on that. Um, even though after a month we did open up shop, um, but we, we also did make masks, but for some reason I, I, I just, I felt somehow that I, I didn't want to profit from, I didn't want to profit from making masks and that, that may sound emotional, but that was just, that was just the way I felt. And I also felt that um, even when I did make the masks, and I sold them at 350 or 400 Naira at the very most. It was, I, I wasn't really going to be making that much money anyway at the end of the day. So what, what was the point? But I know that a lot of people um, jumped on that and it was really good for them. Um, but then of course, I then started making it later anyway. So that, that was not a problem for me. So that, that, that was lucky for me. Um, the, the one thing that worried me at the time, I had just taken a loan from a bank and um, I was even hoping to pay it back before the, uh, before the maturity date. But what I then quickly did was ask them to please restructure or, or completely halt the, uh, the repayment process, which luckily they did. In fact, they had uh, taken out the, the month, the, um, the payment for the month and then reversed that. So I was really grateful to them. Um, like I said, we didn't have the cash and there was no inflow. Um, so everything was put on ice. And one thing I also did at the time was I started listening to a lot of webinars and um, there were thousands. I'd never even heard of Zoom at, at that time. <laughs> so we, of course, started connecting with my staff uh, through Zoom. Uh, but the words recalibrate, rethink, re-strategize, um, fill the technological highways, was those words were flying all around the place. And everyone was online. So of course the world was going digital. There were no, mm -hmm. th there was no, there was no touch and feel anymore. And the smartest thing to do naturally was to immediately improve on our social media platforms, strengthen our digital presence and work on improving um, the look of our website. And I really think that's pro that probably con contributed to our first um, sales. So we started um, driving sales very slowly through that. Um, and, um, we, we normally we would have depended on sales from our, 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 our Ikoi store because we have a store in Ikoi. We strengthen the online channels because like I heard someone say the other day, the world was moving from um, place to space. Um, and then of course we became very flexible with, with, uh, payment, uh, with payments and people suddenly, our customers started asking for payment plans, which were very, very happy to, we, to jump, jump on board with them because so we could, we could they could then pay twice or thrice for, for the product. Of course, we cut costs naturally. Um, we started looking at leaner ways of producing. We had quite a bit of um, raw materials on the ground. So we started to use what we had in stock and made it work for us. We even sort of tweaked mm -hmm. some, some handbag designs to accommodate what existing materials we had at our disposal. Um, so we didn't need too much um, external help in terms of uh, raw materials. And then of course, when yeah. the time came and the opportunity um, with the MasterCard came up, it was so easy, easy to, to retool our factory um, because we had the machines and all we then did was just hire a few more people um, and uh, remote tailors who were working on the outside. We hired some to actually work within the factory because we, were, we keep thinking of safety at, as we work along and we started to produce um, PPE for hospitals and the general public. Um, so, um, moving forward, yeah. we now know okay. that, yes, we must, mm -hmm. we must be able to survive six months if there's a crisis. So 
yes, we did have a reserve account, but we were not really operating it. So now I'm taking it very seriously. And we started uh, actively operating our um, interest bearing account very seriously so that we would not be caught on our way. Yeah. Of course, nobody knows, but hey, I mean, it was just a step we immediately took. And then, of course, um, you know, another thing I would just like to add was we didn't take insurance um, seriously. Um, and of course, the okay. NSAS um, movement has shown that, you know what, insurance is just as key. So we immediately invited our insurance brokers and we started the process of, um, of, of, of um, placing um, insurance policies in place. Yeah, so that, mm -hmm. that, that's it. Yes, yes. Insurance is not a very popular thing in Nigeria. I think because many people don't believe in it. And maybe also partly because we're so religious. They just say, God forbid. You know, <laughs> instead, of buying, <laughs> instead of buying an insurance policy, someone is there saying, God forbid, bad thing. <laughs> but those bad things always happen to even good people and also bad people. So yeah. good one there. So um, our time is, uh, you know, fast spent. Um, we need to move quickly. But I, I need to ask a few more questions. If I can turn to Kiari, and this question is about the government intervention. Uh, do you think uh, they go far enough? Uh, what else do you think government can do or do differently? Um, uh, uh, thank you, Taiwo. I, I think uh, one commendable thing that the central bank has done is what um, um, Femi had just mentioned, which is the forbearance. And I believe that they were even pushing the banks to raise the rate of forbearance um, by a larger percentage. I think it's somewhere around 40% or so. And central bank's target was uh, 60%, basically restructuring the loans. Uh, essentially, it is a way of injecting liquidity into the system. Now, unfortunately, that skips an entire segment, the most critical segment of our businesses, which are the SMEs, because not all SMEs have access to banking uh, or rather to credit in that regard. Uh, and then some of the pa uh, palliatives that government had uh, introduced, some were actually what I call um, giving fish uh, rather than actually teaching fishing. Uh, mm -hmm. So essentially, that's another, um, you know, dislocation, if you think, if you think about it. Of course, the critical thing is for life, uh, you know, sustaining uh, items. Uh, I would have loved to see in addition to the palliatives, which is feeding uh, some of our underprivileged and, uh, uh, but there should be policy initiative where a large amounts of, uh, whether it is, uh, what I call a catalytic capital, basically capital that the government can inject that could either be a convertible debt to equity or in some cases, a silent equity that could come in um, and uh, basically boost the engine, especially for manufacturers such as uh, Femi and uh, what Yemi had mentioned and what Larry had mentioned about some of the businesses they were advising. At the startup levels that I have seen, and, and by the way, I chair an insurance company and we have, we have been saying to businesses that insurance is critical. Our mm -hmm. penetration rate in Nigeria for insurance is less than 2%, uh, sorry, uh, it's 1.2% or thereabouts. Whereas mm -hmm. you go to a country like Ivory Coast, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 5% penetration which is like four or five times that of Nigeria. And essentially for us in this particular insurance company, we have seen increase in our revenue. Our claims have gone down. So for the first time, actually the company is uh, quite, quite profitable. Unfortunately, it is not even the right time to be, to be, to be saying that because there should be more calls on insurance, especially with the violence and uh, disruptions and burning of locations and things like that. So essentially mm. what we have seen in the economy is that the intervention by government ought to be reversed or ought to be, you know, in addition to the palliatives given, uh, there should be a uh, more creative way of injecting liquidity into businesses, especially uh, SMEs. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I just stay with you for a quick comment on, on the fact that interest rates have been falling. Uh, and in fact, 90-day uh, T-bills uh, yield was reported to be negative 0.09%. Uh, 
uh, recently. Do you think this is helping in, in any way uh, for businesses to be able to, their ability to raise funds? So, so, so it, naturally, when interest rates are falling, there are two categories of people, the savers. Some of us that are retired would actually want to love on uh, decent interest rates uh, so that yeah. you can keep body and soul together. Now, on the other hand, and, and the, it is those surpluses that come in. And so when treasury bills crashed, at one point, it was actually negative, which is quite uh, challenging. But on the other side, companies that have access to, um, to, to credit would tend to can negotiate lower credit or even in the restructuring, one can negotiate lower credit. So in essence, it's good for businesses, especially businesses that are what I would call in an investment mode. Uh, the other angle to this is basically to look at the pension funds and all of that, where they were putting a lot of money into uh, treasury bills and uh, bonds. Now they would have to look at uh, things more critically and it might be the beginning of the conversation of if this persists post the pandemic then what we might begin to see is creative deployment of capital and that may actually be good in the long run right yeah. now it may be inconvenient for many people but uh, long term I would imagine that that can bring about that level of creativity and innovation in terms of deployment of capital into the right infrastructural uh, elements, into the right investments, be it manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that we have also ratified AFCFTA, we will now be in a position where we must be competitive as a nation. And you cannot be competitive if you are not manufacturing uh, uh, your raw materials into finished or semi-finished uh, products. Uh, we have been for a long time living it as an extractive economy and we need to be more creative and growth oriented mindset. And that would basically uh, play a, uh, in the long run can be an advantage, advantage that we mm -hmm. need to uh, take that opportunity and run with it. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, we need to take uh, questions from participants in a few minutes. Uh, let me quickly ask uh, Yemi, uh, we, we are in this together, government, private sector, individuals, you know, what have you. What role do you think that the private sector should be playing, especially the financial services sector, in providing liquidity to support businesses? Without, of course, we need to bear in mind uh, that the money they also have is not their money, so they have to be responsible with it. How do they do that without significantly increasing their own risk? Sorry, yeah, I had to I mute. Mean, yeah, yeah I, I had to admit. Um, look, this this is a this this is a balancing act. They have to protect both their customer and their commercial interests. So, in 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 terms of private sector, um, people are doing everything they can. I I, I would I, I run um, a female angel network, a Rising Tide Africa, and what we saw was that it, the the pandemic was it was trifling. Uh, um, uh, 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 funded businesses and and these are startups that you know in the ordinary course may, may not survive um, and and if they do survive you know their their growth was steep but during the pandemic we we had to do follow up investments um, for them even though we were uncertain of the outcome of 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 the the businesses so you know it's 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 something that is, is the time for partnering, partnering and patients, you know, across board in the private sector. Well, my, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the main thing that we need to put at the back of our minds is after all of this is done, we still need customers at the other side. So in, in, in terms of taking decisions about your own internal uh, um, uh, interest, and the customer's internal interest, you have to know how to balance it out. In terms of financial institutions, um, you would see that from what Femi has said, they have started, they have started to look at you know, flexible models, um, repayments, deferrals, you know, in, in, in 
installment deferrals, interest reliefs, and they are already doing all of this. However, let us not also forget that these financial institutions are also experiencing the same type of, of, of effects of the pandemic on their own businesses. I mean, diminishing transactions and, and deposits, for instance, um, you know, the, the issues of cybersecurity on their businesses. So all of these have to play with, with their own decisions. Yeah, um, you know, the, 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 the IT in, in industry, what, what, what we are doing is that we are giving, you know, phased instrumental payments, longer periods of, of, of payments to our clients. Why? Because if they are unable to operate, everybody is moving to digital. And if mm. the, your, your customers are unable to operate during this period of time, and you are not understanding um, their liquidity um, 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 concerns, then at the end of the day, you would not have any customers. So the thing is about the private sector is all in all, they have to be patient and they have to partner so that they, ha they have sustainable businesses at the end of this pandemic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very, very important, actually. Uh, good point there. So let me let me ask uh, Landry uh, this, this next question. Uh, we know that sometimes the knee-jerk reaction is to try and say, you know what, cut cost, 25% across the board. Uh, so we think it's not wise to simply cut costs during a crisis. Rather, we should focus on cutting waste uh, while some costs may even need to go up. We've seen companies where, you know, costs relating to technology, data, you know, are going up. Even, you know, sometimes you find a company says, you know, no training anymore because we don't have the money. And uh, not knowing that training itself is what they need to be able to, to adapt and, and take advantage of the opportunities that are available out there. And in the study that uh, PwC conducted, there was a concept of good cause and bad cost. Uh, so in your own view, what's your thoughts around blanket cost cutting as a strategy for survival? And maybe if you can also make, you know, uh, one or two, uh, you know, comment of one or two sentences on, on government intervention and what you think about that. Okay, thank you. Um, blanket cost costing is usually not the most optimal decision, particularly in a, a crisis. Um, in, in fact, in some cases, it actually pose a great business continuity risk. Um, as we've mentioned, yes, you know, some costs really should come down and, um, and some will actually go up. I think the, the overarching, you know, uh, philosophy is, you know, and I'm trying to quote uh, a business leader I was in a, in a meeting with recently. Uh, the philosophy should be cut fat, not muscle. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're trying to get rid of waste. You know, you, you look through uh, your operations and you're trying to eliminate waste. But there are ligaments, tendons, muscle that actually bind, the, you know, different aspects of the operations together that you cannot afford to cut. Otherwise, then the business could actually, you know, die a natural death. Um, you know, as you mentioned, experience shows that actually as you cut, defer, or actually eliminate some costs, you know, other costs inevitably will, will, will go up, you know. Um, of course, broadband is a big one these days. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in my office, for example, we've we've been working remotely since March. Um, so we've saved on some running costs, you know, um, fueling of our generators and so on and so forth. Uh, but we are spending more on broadband connectivity because we need to keep, you know, uh, the team together. We need people to to continue to work together. Uh, hmm. You know, so so some costs will naturally go go up. And you know, training is another one that I think is very important. Um, as, as businesses will tell you, well, our people are our greatest assets. And, you know, you have to keep investing in that, in that asset base, you know, through training. Um, for most people, you know, training is the first line that goes up, but we can look for creative ways to continue to train. You know, there are all sorts of platforms available today uh, for, 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 for small amounts of subscriptions. You can get, you know, um, a lot of the people trained. So yes, some costs will go up, but um, blank, blanket cost cutting um, would, would never be a solution. I think the point is that, Business leaders need to now work with their finance teams or in fact, where their small businesses get into the brass tacks, understand, literally itemize every, you know, every component of your cost, both operating and capital, and decide whether or not these are discretionary or you need to 
actually incur them. Uh, so cut where you need to cut, um, invest more where you need to invest more, uh, but not, not a blanket cost. Otherwise, you know, the business mm. would actually uh, fail. Uh, in terms of government intervention, whether or not they, they go far enough, uh, indeed, there's been some laudable um, uh, developments. You know, we talked about the CBN interventions, although there might be debates about the implementation effectiveness, you know, of some of these interventions. But, you know, generally we've seen them, you know, uh, a lot of businesses have been beneficiaries of, of the uh, forbearances and moratorium on, on existing facilities. Um, you know, uh, the federal government, in fact, the Finance Act 2019 was almost, you know, um, spot on in terms of timing because you know it was passed in you know early, early this year there about ahead of, of COVID almost as if we saw COVID coming so businesses earning less than uh, making turnover less than um, 25 million I believe you know exempt from tax you know businesses making between 25 and 100 and you know are now taxed at a lower rate and so on and a few other provisions uh, in fact the finance bill for 2020 also there are you know provisions around um, um, exempting small businesses from education tax and, and so on and so forth, minimizing or reducing uh, the minimum tax for, for, for applicable companies. Those are useful. Um, my biggest challenge would be to the subnationals, you know, the state governments and local governments. Every business operates in a state. Indeed, every business operates in a local government area. So because sometimes when we talk about government intervention, we are thinking of the federal government. But the question is, what are the state governments doing to support businesses? You know, we still hear about, you know, double taxation. We've been hearing these stories for decades. You know, as you are finishing with one audit, somebody is coming to bring you radio and TV license tax and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the subnationals need to work with, the, with, with, with businesses, need to work with the federal government to figure out how to just give businesses a, a little break, you know, particularly during this, this, this difficult time. Um, so there's quite a lot of work to be done there. Um, uh, some states have been quite proactive in this regard. I, I know Bayelsa, Kebi. Uh, Ogun State and, and Lagos State, you know, you know, in terms of uh, deferring or uh, actually waiving, you know, penalties and interest on outstanding tax liabilities, um, allowing companies to 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 defer or delay um, their filing obligations and so on. All of these measures are just re really required, um, um, necessary to just help businesses a little bit manage their liquidity. Because really, even when you are turning to an audit, it's time that you could have spent building your business, a tax mm. audit. I mean. Um, yeah. So my challenge would be to the subnational government. You know, it's not all about the federal government because when we talk federal um, government interventions, we automatically think federal government. Um, there's been some, you know, laudable um, programs by the government. But my challenge is to the subnationals, the state mm -hmm. government and the local government. What are you doing to support businesses and help them thrive during this difficult period? They really do deserve a break. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Actually, I think we tend to only just focus on the federal government alone. Um, not knowing that in many cases, particularly for small businesses, they actually feel the impact of the subnational more than the federal government. Unfortunately, during the crisis, as businesses were trying to adapt and look for creative ways to continue in business, we were seeing no manner of things that were very negative uh, from some state, some local government introducing new taxes uh, because the top people were making a lot of money from state logistics. Um, Instead of even NIPOS at some point was, was uh, you know, increasing their, their, their fees and charges, which I thought was misplaced uh, and inappropriate as of the time. So um, as we begin to wrap up now, um, let's, let's see whether we can get something that's bright and some bright spots and something more positive uh, to, to talk about. And, and, and the fact is, if we have recent announcements around promising COVID-19 vaccines from Pfizer to AstraZeneca. Um, and then, you know, I read the report by the IMF saying that over 90% of the economies in the world will go into recession. We saw our own recession numbers a couple of days ago. Uh, so we now have two consecutive quarters of, of decline in GDP. But it wasn't as bad as we had feared. So the question I'm going to ask Femi, and then I'll ask Yemi to also make some comments about that. Are we at the end of the tunnel? Should we be excited that the bad days are behind us or almost soon to be over? Yeah, I think you have to unmute. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I said, I will, I will just very quickly say that I have a positive mindset anyway. So, <laughs> um, so yes, 
um, whichever way it, 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 it goes, really. Of course, there are many questions to be asked here, um, and I don't know that anyone has the answers. Are we getting the vaccines in Africa? When are we getting the vaccines in Africa? How safe are they? I remember my daughter saying the other day that um, until um, if a million vaccines have been injected and a million people have survived, <laughs> then she won't, she won't be <laughs> going near any vaccine. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Um, on Sunday, I think it was Sunday, I read in the papers that um, Nigeria, Nigeria is ex experiencing its worst recession ever. Um, I think I also read somewhere online yesterday where the minister was saying that recession will soon be over. So whichever way we cut it, I think we're still inside the tunnel. Um, and it's really up to us as individuals, as SMEs, as um, 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 sector leaders to begin to claw our way out because we really cannot um, fold our arms and just sit it out. And um, like Larry said, it's, it's, it's not just about the federal government, it's also about all the um, layers beneath. Um, so for me, um, we can only hope, but then, hey, um, we, we have a role to play. I think that as, as, as SMEs, um, we need to start playing a bigger role. We need to start ensuring on our parts that we begin to put systems in. Sometimes we think we're too small to put systems and processes in place, but I really don't think so. Let's at least start somewhere, you know, because it is, that's, those are the things that will help um, strengthen um, our ecosystems, our, our small companies. Um, we, be, we need to begin to um, collaborate more. I love what um, Yemi said about um, be patient and partner more. I, I really loved that. And then uh, Mario also said, I'll be making scribbling away, um, cut the fats um, and, and not the most, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, not the most. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, um, so I really love that. So we just have to fight the fair, um, keep a mind, positive mindset through this, however difficult it may seem and just keep going. Um, do what we can with what we have, um, look for the opportunities wherever we can find them and grab them. Um, and like they say, don't, don't waste a crisis. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so can I ask uh, Yemi to make some remarks on that? Yeah, um, Femi is a true Nigerian. We are a resilient, <laughs> we are a resilient people. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, you know, vaccine, announcing on the vaccine may be a light of hope, um, but for us in Africa, I am not sure that brings us hope in the next one year. Um, the, 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 the issues around the vaccine are uncertain, like Femi has said, we don't know the duration of the community. We are not set, we don't have the kind of infrastructure. So I understand that the vaccine needs to be put in, in um, a, a regulated uh, minus 80 degrees centigrade and, and can only last for 30 days. And so all of those, all of those, do we have the infrastructure to refrigerate and how many people will it get to? Um, do we, you know, the structure for me is, is, a, is, a, is, is a major issue, even if it comes to, to Nigeria. So, I mean, well, in terms of um, outlook for next, next year, like I said, we're resilient people. We have hope all the time in, in spite of whatever situation we find ourselves in. Um, we, we are looking at the numbers and saying that um, it's 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 the it's improving even though it's still negative, um, but but we, we must understand that we are not an isolated economy. The the ripple effect of the global ec uh, economy will come to Nigeria. Um, it's only a matter of time. Economies have shut down all over the or, you know shutting down and there's a third wave of COVID. We ha it hasn't hit us yet. And if it hits us, are we going to lock down again? Um, or are we going to ignore it? So all of these things are, are the things we should be mindful of when we are looking into the future and seeing whether the tunnel, the light we are seeing is really the light at the end of the tunnel, or we're still um, at, the, at the middle of, of, the, of the tunnel. But all mm -hmm. said, uh, all of this said, um, we, we must take responsibility as individuals and as businesses. Um, we must think 
out of the box, out of, uh, we must be innovative. We must look in the longer term. Those are the lessons that we have learned now. We must look at the longer term uh, in, in our planning. Um, we, we must also have different opportunities and be ready to diversify. Don't say stock, uh, I've been in this business for 12 years and, and yeah. right now you want me to go and sell food. No, think about the way of, in which you can also su survive and, and have a major impact in, in, um, on, on the socioeconomic development of, of Nigeria. Thank mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. Very well said, very well said. Yeah. We have just five minutes now to wrap up. So I'm gonna ask uh, each of you to give your parting shot in like 30 seconds, if you can. Let me start with Kiari. Uh, mine is actually to say that um, I would enjoy in businesses to be more creative and innovative in their approach. Uh, innovation doesn't mean going and getting something that has not been there. Uh, even ways of doing things that is different from what you are used to, um, those are the things that can actually bring about the necessary change. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, uh, uh, Nigeria being spiritual, uh, we would put in that resilience and spirituality into play as well. It may not necessarily be the only answer, but it's just a factor. Thank you. Yeah, I think it helps just to be positive sometimes and be religious can help you mentally. Can I ask Femi to make um, her comments? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Yeah. 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 No okay. Problem. Yes. Um. Uh, I've mean, I've really enjoyed this. I'm um, listening to everybody, and um, like I said, I've, I've taken a few notes. I know that one thing um, that has been said across board is cash is king, but um, knowledge is also very critical. So it's it's very mm. important to understand your business. Um, it's important to carry out scenario analysis, like um, someone said, and strength and strengthening your uh, stakeholder engagement. We've talked about partnerships. We've talked about collaborations um, in order to stay. We've talked about um, having conducive business environments in order to stay uh, resilient. Um, and then um, there was also the talk of running businesses that are not solely focused on the Naira because of the volatility of, of, our, of our currencies. And of course, creative, uh, um, someone said um, something about the banks having creative ways of injecting um, um, funding for SM injecting creativity into funding of SMEs. That is so important because SMEs, we find that the rules are so stringent. We're not even going near the, near the banks. But for me, what, what, what has been, what, what stands out, what shines out most for me is um, being able to operate more flexibly um, in this environment. Um, Yemi said, you know, you need to think out of the box. And that's exactly what we did. And I'll use the, I mean, shining example, I'd like to say, because we just finished the Lagos Leather Fair, which is usually a, a physical event. Um, but this year we realized that that was not going to happen. So we just finished um, a totally virtual event, which I didn't think was possible at all. Um, yeah. And um, we, we created a, a virtual platform and we just did what we had to do and we, we moved mm -hmm. on with it. So that is it. Um, look, we, 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 we have only two choices, um, make yes. excuses or make progress to do or not mm -hmm. to do, to see the cup half yes. full or and never empty. I'd never see yeah. it empty. And of course, to always Thanks. see possibilities and not challenges. Thank you. Yes, yes, power of positivity. I like that. So can I ask Larry for your 30 seconds closing comments? Okay, thank you very much. I would say, uh, you know, just to echo what um, Femi and Kerry have said, uh, it's about redefining business models. Um, and sometimes a very simple framework, you know, could help. You know, sometimes people are struggling. How do I even go about this? You need to answer three questions. You know, who your customers are, what you're providing to them, and how. You know, if you are able to really get down and distill, you know, first, identify your current business, answer those three questions along with your current business, and then it helps you then to know what else you could do. Um, equally as important is to know what your, who your customers are not and what you're not providing and what you're not going to do. So it helps to, to, to sharpen the focus. The other would be to the monetary um, authorities, the CBN. Um, I think it's important to try to achieve uh, convergence in, in, in exchange rate, you know, um, because of the sheer uh, quantum of, 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 of what goes on in the official market and the power market, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of room for, for arbitrage. So we're not even sure the pressures we feel, you know, you know in, in the effects, you know, uh, how much is real? How much of that is, you know, uh, effective uh, uh, demand? 
And then the, the last uh, uh, bit will be around um, optimism. I would say we should, we should proceed cautiously. Um, you know, the light sometimes you see at the end of the tunnel could be, yes, freedom. It could also be an oncoming freight train. So it's important that we, we proceed with caution and um, not just leave everything on, on hope. You know, as people say, hope is not a strategy. Thank you. Indeed, hope is not a strategy. Yemi, please, your closing comments. <laughs> I, I, I would say that businesses should look um, progressively. And I, I go back to partnering and patience. It is not only for the um, you looking at financial institutions and others to be patient with you or partner with you, but it's also the responsibility of each business to look at their stakeholders and see how best they can partner and hand be patient with them. I would also, um, you know, sit down with your financial institutions. Financial institutions in the private sector, they need to understand and go deep with the businesses. It is now time to handhold and build your business, business loyalty. Um, one of the things that we're doing in the IT sector is looking at data. Even though it's the data for the short time, um, the period of this pandemic, but we are using it to analyze, you know, what, what we need to do need to do better um, for, for our businesses. And let's not forget that health is wealth. Do not mm -hmm. ignore your health. Um, personally, the health of your business and, and the health of your employees. That is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are in this together. Mm -hmm. Business and liquidity is not a big problem for you. Find a way to help all the other stakeholders within your value. Don't extend the payment period for your suppliers if you can afford to pay them earlier, particularly if they're struggling. Uh, the same way that you shouldn't just lay off staff because they're looking at them to join me in our We can't hear you. In